Greetings, and welcome to the CCOF Foundation Practical Guide to Organic Crop Insurance webinar. To start, I wanted to review some acknowledgments and disclaimers. We wanted to acknowledge that today's webinar is supported through a grant from the USDA Risk Management Agency. Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this webinar are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the view of the US Department of Agriculture. This presentation highlights features of the Whole Farm Revenue Protection Program and is not intended to be comprehensive. The information presented neither modifies or replaces terms and conditions of the WFRP policy and the county actuarial documents. If you are having difficulties connecting to the webinar, if you can't hear or can't see, please call our office for support at 831-423-2263. Press zero for the operator and someone will help you connect to the webinar. My name is Megan Donovan. I will be your host today. I'm a program specialist at the CCUF Foundation. The CCUF Foundation advances organic agriculture for a healthy world through education and hardship grants, technical assistance, and consumer education. Before we get started with our main presentation, I wanted to let you know how you can participate in today's web event. We're looking at an example of the GoToWebinar attendee interface, which is made up of two parts, the viewer window on the left, which allows you to see everything the presenter will share on their screen, and the control panel on the right. Within the control panel is how you can participate in today's event, so let's take a look at that. By clicking the orange arrow, you can open and close the control panel. From the view menu, you can also set the control panel not to auto-hide when inactive if you prefer to always keep it open. The audio pane provides audio information. By default, you have joined the webinar via mic and speakers. If you prefer, you can join the audio via telephone by selecting phone call and the dial-in information will be displayed. During the presentation, you can send questions to our webinar staff through the questions pane. Simply type in your question and click send. Throughout the webinar, we will stop from time to time for questions and answers. You'll answer as many questions as we have time for. As a final reminder, today's webinar is being recorded and everyone will receive an email with a link to view a recording of today's event along with a PDF of the PowerPoint slides. Today we also have a copy of the PDF of the PowerPoint slides available for download through GoToWebinar. Click on the blue file name in the handout of the handouts pane. A PDF of the slides will open in your internet browser. You can view them in the browser or download them onto your computer. To expand or collapse the handouts and questions pane, click on the triangle next to the name of the pane. For example, if you can't see the box of the questions pane, click on the triangle and it'll expand to show the box. So we wanted to encourage you to uh, test out the questions pane and write in. Let us know where you're calling in from today and what you produce on your farm or ranch and we'll loop back around to that information a little later in the presentation. And we just want to let you know we're going to try to get to as many questions and comments as possible today. Um, but if we don't get to your specific question, please follow up with us after the webinar and we'll have some contact information for you. So with that, I would like to um, welcome our two presenters. We're very happy to have both Ann Beyer and Jeff Suzinski with us this afternoon from the National Center of Appropriate Technology, also known as NCAT. Jeff serves as an agriculture and natural resource economist in the NCAT office in Butte, Montana. He has been working with the whole farm approach to ensuring farms for 14 years and will be leading today's crop insurance conversation. Anne is an organic and sustainable agriculture specialist with NCAT. She also has worked as an organic inspector for CCOF and other certifiers since 2000, inspecting organic farms, livestock operations, and processing facilities to the National Organic Program and International Organic Standards. Today, Anne will highlight how organic record keeping can assist growers in applying for crop insurance. So Anne and Jeff, welcome. And Jeff, I will turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Megan. <clears throat> 
Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think this is something like my 50th presentation of crop insurance. Um, bear with me if I get too jargonistic. Um, chat in, <laughs> help me to stop. Today we're just gonna look at some basic practical ideas and some examples about crop insurance. Um, what can be insured and where? I'm gonna particularly emphasize whole farm revenue protection, something I've been working with for many, many years, and um, it's a unique approach to crop insurance. How to request an insurance quote, a case study, just to give you a sense of how whole farm works. Uh, and, then we're, and, and Anne's gonna do more with the policy record, record keeping and claims and certification and some take homes. And jargon, um, I'm just gonna read it quickly. Liability, the value of what is insured. These might be uh, known to all of you, but I'll just go through them quickly because they're used a lot in insurance. Indemnity, the value of the payout. The, what you get paid should you have a cause of loss. Premium, the cost of insuring. And then crop insurance, which is federally subsidized, that has both a farmer component and a taxpayer component. Of course, most farmers are uh, just uh, interested in the, what it costs them, not what it costs the taxpayer. Um, yield insurance is also known as multi-peril because there are multiple perils that can affect your yields. Uh, and these are risks that impact yield, drought being one of many. Uh, revenue insurance is distinct in that it is both price and yield risk. Uh, revenue insurance is kind of a Cadillac of insurance because you cover two types of risk, the multiple peril or yield plus any change in price. As you all know, when you plant a crop, you might have one price expectation and then the reality hits at the end and you have a different price expectation and they aren't often the same. So there is an exposure to risk in terms of price. Revenue covers both price and yield risk. Then there are really two really fundamental different types of insurance. Um, and the one that most people are familiar with is single product, uh, corn insurance, soybean insurance, um, tomato insurance that's for a specific crop. Or you have something which I'll talk about a lot, whole farm revenue protection, WFRP as it's commonly used in, uh, in, in a, anyway, it, uh, it's a WFRP or whole farm is protecting the revenue of the whole farm. It's not about what crop you grow. It's really about protecting the revenue of all the crops and products you grow, including livestock. I'm not here to sell crop insurance. Sometimes when I give these talks, I may sound like a, uh, at least a crop insurance agent for whole farm revenue protection, but I'm really not here to sell you insurance. I'm here to, to describe the programs. Um, and you might not need to buy insurance. Um, in fact, not all farmers do and, and many farmers don't. And there are many ways to mitigate risk besides insurance. And insurance does cost money. Um, there's debate about whether one should even think of it as an expense or if one should think about it as an investment, but nonetheless it does cost and it is, even though it is highly subsidized, um, it still does um, affect your bottom line. So there are different ways to mitigate risk, including crop insurance. Um, how to find out what's available, the, the risk management, this is a, uh, the front page of the web, of the website of the Risk Management Agency, which is the federal agency that essentially runs all federally subsidized crop insurance programs in the United States. Their, their website is quite new, um, at least a couple of years old only, and they've been working at a lot. I think it's a lot more user friendly and it, you can go and play there. There are some things that are harder than others to use, but it is um, it's a good resource and how to find out what's available. You can see that on the front page there was a something called commodities. You could press that link and this shows you what would come up. Uh, and then basically you can choose a commodity. You can stay in a state like California and then it will give you, uh, it'll tell you where and if uh, there's insurance available in that 
uh, state. Another way to do this is looking at it, there's a map availability, a map viewer availability that will actually show the um, different availabilities of crop insurance policies across the United States. It's quite, it looks nice because it's visual and we're going to go do a few of those. Um, one thing is about crop insurance is that there are many different types of crop insurance, um, as, as I already explored, um, and there is also uh, crop insurance for a lot of different crops. However, they're not always available in every place that one lives. Um, and the unit of analysis in crop insurance, the way to think of it is county. And literally, you may have uh, a crop insurance policy for a specific crop in one county, and right next door, it might not be available. Um, there may be certain types of insurance policies available in one county and not available in another county. I get these questions a lot uh, from folks and farmers, and they say, well, can I protect lavender? And then the first thing I have to ask them is what county they're in. And because I can't really begin to explore whether there is an insurance policy for lavender unless I know where they're located. And by the way, there isn't, uh, except for whole farm revenue protection, there really is no uh, policy for lavender. We'll just take a look at a few of the some crops to give you a sense of this. So this is a map of the United States. Uh, and you can see all the, I think there's 3,300 counties in the United States. You can see them all delineated in little squares and boxes. And this is where you can find uh, insurance policies for corn in 2019. And you can see there's quite a few places in the United States that you can buy a corn and even corn revenue policies. However, here's an example of where it gets a little sparse. Um, if you wanted to insure cabbage in the United States, and you gotta look carefully down there by Florida and in Georgia, you can see a few counties that in 2019 that offered cabbage policies. So again, uh, if I'm in Montana where I'm right now, or you're in California, you cannot insure cabbage as cabbage alone in those two states. And here's strawberries, another crop that's probably more important to California. And you can see, in fact, that California has some of the only counties in which you can insure strawberries as strawberries. And here's the policy I'll begin to talk more about now, is whole farm revenue protection. Whole farm revenue is available in every county in the United States. So no matter where you are, you can always protect your whole farm's revenue. And that again is dependent on the crops and livestock products you grow, not on any one specific one. So even here, me in Montana, I can grow fresh market tomatoes and I can insure them with a whole farm revenue protection policy. So what can be insured under whole farm? Really almost any agricultural crop or livestock product. Um, there is no show, sport, or pet animals, so that's one category, and it doesn't extend to forest products. Again, it's available in all counties, and, and, and it can be done through any kind of marketing. Any way that you market your crop is still uh, insurable. It doesn't depend on how you sell your products. Uh, again, whole farm insures the whole farm's revenue based on all crops or livestock products you've grown. The premium cost subsidy increases with each added product up to seven. Um, why it stops at seven, there's really no room, really good reason for that. It's just the policy stops there. Partly, I think the idea is that once you're up to eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 crops, the, the uh, advantage, the incentive would be very marginal anyway. Um, you must have farmed at least five years or three years of a beginning farmer. And for this policy, and, and for this policy only, uh, the definition of a beginning farm for home farm revenue is 10 years or less of farming. That's important. You get a subsidized also for your premium if you're a beginning farmer, and you don't have, to have as many records to apply for it. So this is not a policy that can work for a fresh 
farmer who's never had any production experience. You have to do, develop at least, if a beginning farmer, at least three years of a revenue history. And it covers and it has a limitation into liability. Remember, liability is the value of what you're covering. So what you grow that value for crops can't be above 8.5 million and it can't and in and, and the livestock that you might have in there can't go over two million and that includes nursery and greenhouses. Um, it's a bit confusing, but it also depends. Uh, you have a wide um, level of coverages you can choose from. Anywhere from 50% coverage of your whole farm revenue expectations or up to 85% of your whole farm. However, the 85 and 80% coverage level are only available if you have three major crops that are part or products that are part of your farm's revenue. And that is, if you look at the first line, 85, and you see three, and you see 10,000 maximum farm of your revenue, that's because 85% of 10,000 is the 8.5 million maximum. So in a way, you can actually um, have a farm that's generating more revenue than 8.5 million, depending on the coverage level and the amount of commodities you grow. And those commodities, it's called commodities to count, have to be significant contribution. If you have a tiny bit of some crop that you're growing, a product you're growing, a very small amount of your, of your revenue, that often is bundled together into a separate commodity and won't stand alone as a commodity. But again, the important thing is you need those at least three to get the higher level of coverage. Again, it's the only federal shop insurance option uh, for many crops and livestock in many counties, as, you, as I showed you with the cabbage and strawberries, for instance. Uh, provides insurance, insurance for diverse operations. Um, it is probably designed more for, uh, for uh, uh, systems of production with multiple livestock and, pro uh, and crop products. Um, so it's, it, 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 is, it can be used and is being used by farms as low as even one commodity in some cases, in some very unusual cases, but, um, but mostly it's uh, three, four, five, and up to, um, there have been people using Old Farm with up to 20 or 30 different crops. Uh, organic pricing is embedded in your history. So this policy is dependent upon your whole farm revenues history Therefore, if you've been an organic farmer for the three years or the five years before you're eligible to apply, those prices are already embedded in a sense in your revenue. Therefore, the, your value of your revenue is already approximated to an organic value. And it's very unique in that sense that your organic value is just kind of embedded in the policy itself. That's not always true. And as, as simple as it is if you're doing single organic and non-organic crops. Having crop insurance can also, and is often important for folks in qualifying for loans. So that's another use of it. Just to give you some sense in California, the use of a whole farm, this is a, a we did a study and we only have data for separating out uh, organic and farms, but in other, in, in, in especially specific crops. This is actually including all organic and non-organic, but you can see that, again, these are the individual crops that make up that those bundles of products that are, are part of a whole farm revenue. And you can see that the value, again, the value over these three years, almonds, walnuts, and cherries, and pistachios are quite a uh, quite significant part of the bundle of farms using it. But over the, you know, over these three years, it's almost up to a billion dollars in value has been insured. And, and even though these are the top 20, there were 79 distinct products insured under whole farm revenue in California over these three years. Quite a bit of diversity covered there. And again, the revenue is limited for livestock and animal products to 2 million and greenhouse and nursery as well. Hemp is something very new this year for the first time. And uh, this year in 2020, whole farm revenue production currently is the only way in which uh, hemp can be insured. And that includes fiber, flour, and seeds. However, they have made 
rather unique restrictions for hemp um, that aren't true for other crops. And one of those is that you have to have a you have to have a contract for the purchase of the hemp to to be able to insure it in 2020. And that and that is very important. Um, many people will grow hemp both under contract and then without a contract. And it's only going to insure that part of the hemp that is under contract. And it has to meet the federal regulations and laws, which are, are pretty extensive and have just been published. So they're quite new. And another important thing that is that is really important to know is the THC level, uh, it, which includes, this is the way industrial hemp is defined, is 0.3% or less. So, the, and if you are over that, then your product has to be destroyed. And that unfortunately in this first year anyway, is not an insurable cause of loss. It's important to know. And they are pursuing individual crop policies for hemp uh, in the future. How to request a, co a quote. Again, there's an online tool. It's pretty good. You can actually choose things like distance from your place, um, the specialized crop you can do, and you just use the locator page. It's quite nice, works fairly well. Again, to request a quote for Whole Farm, you need your Schedule F. Again, this, uh, as we go through the example later, we'll show you that you, you need at least the five or three years of filed uh, tax forms, and usually for farmers, that's a Schedule F. If you do not have a Schedule F or use some other form of filing, the agent will help you turn that form of filing into the equivalent of a Schedule F. And you need them for five years if you're an, a not a beginning farmer, or three if you're a beginning, again, 10 years or less. Um, and the expected revenue, and the other thing you're going to need is your expected revenue from the products you're going to grow in the year of your insurance. And there are many ways to, to justify those things. And what you're going to do is basically tell folks what you're going to grow, what your price, what your yield expectation, and what your whole revenue expectations will be for that insurance year. Again, uh, you, we take the historic approved average revenue. The approved means that there are certain elements of the tax form which don't really relate to the revenue generated by the production of agricultural products, and those are removed as the basis of, of insurance. You also have to provide your historic approved expenses. Again, all of this will be done by the crop insurance agent. You just bring in the forms. They calculate these approved expenses and revenue. Expenses are a kind of unique thing to whole farm and unique to all crop insurance, really. And it's really it used as a form of fraud protection. They want to make sure that in the year of insurance, you're expending um, the actual number is 70% of your historic average expenses on the current year so that it doesn't look like you're not using, you know, you're not using expenses. So it's kind of a fraud protection element. And I'm going to give an um, example from Santa Cruz County. I picked this just because I been there a couple of times. I loved the place and I learned that it was the Brussels sprout capital of the world, which seems to be a very popular crop these days. So this is just an example. Uh, there, whole farm pilots are really unique to your revenue history and your cropping systems in the past and currently. And so you can't just easily translate what I'm going to show you into your own farm. Uh, the premium, the premium identity will differ again. This is Santa Cruz County, so it might be different in different counties for the same collection of crops. Um, so it's, it's, again, it's very specific to the location. Again, crop, uh, a crop insurance agent can give you a quote um, that will be more precise and accurate than even this example. And, and, the, and the cost of the will depend on the level of coverage. I'm gonna use 85%, which is the highest for this example, but you any level lower, will of course cost less. The, the more the coverage, the higher the premium. And here's some data. This is from the county ag statistics of 2018. Just to give you some sense of what has been, what was grown in Santa Cruz County. And you can see the berries and strawberries and raspberries. And I also put here in terms of single policy types that are available. And you'll notice that there are many that are there are none. 
There are some that do have revenue policies like apples and, and uh, strawberries. Dollar is kind of a revenue policy. It's a little bit different it's just on the dollar value, but it's pretty much a revenue policy too. Um, and, and then the, whether there's an organic option for those available. And of course, Whole Farm is available for all these products. And so I'm gonna give a simple farm. It's, um, it's just a five product farm strawberries, apples, wine, grape, Brussels sprouts, eggs. I, mean, I know this might be a ridiculous farm. I don't know that there would be anybody like this growing on these, what, four, uh, five, six acres. Uh, but I did try to get some fairly good data on this. Um, you guys could criticize me for that later. It's just an example, but I did base it on some best data I could find. And you can see that the the estimate of revenue in the insurance here is 131,000, and the historic five-year historic just average revenue from the tax forms was 130,000. This is very important to note here that the basis of your insurance is always on the lower of your expected revenue of the year for the year you're going to insure, in this case 2018, and and in the um, historic average revenue that you did. It's the lower of the two. And so this is an important thing to note because it, although in this case, the historic and the, and, the, and, the, and the expected are very close together, in many cases, they could be far apart and it will always be the lower part. And there are some things that we'll discuss later about how, that, how that's fixed a bit, but basically that's an important thing to remember that it's your, your history and your expectations that are assessed. So for this farm, the total premium would be uh, at an 85% coverage level, it would be $8,951 for that $130,000 of, of expected revenue. Again, 130 is the lower of the two. Uh, the farmer's premium cost, however, since these cr all federal crop insurance is subsidized, the farmer ends up only paying about $4,000, $3,938. Your guaranteed insured revenue is $110,500. And essentially that's taking 85% of that 130,000, remember the lower of the two numbers, and that's what your guaranteed revenue is. So if you should fall below 110,500, your indemnity or your payout gets you back to that level. So in a sense, before any payment is made, there must be a loss of 20,000. $528, which means, in a sense, that's like a deductible. That is, so it, no crop, federal crop insurance pays 100% uh, of coverage, so you do have to take some loss uh, even when you take out insurance. Um, now I'm gonna do a case example. I wonder if I, I'm gonna go back just quickly to make sure, okay, I just didn't thought I'd flip two slides there. A loss of 50% of revenue. You say you have a 50% wipeout across the board, uh, across different different crops in different varying ways, but basically you end up with 50% in what you expected to get. And in this case, that's $65,600. So with that case study, the indemnity payment would be, again, that guaranteed amount minus what you actually got. You got the 65, so your indemnity payment would be $44,400. $894. But if you wanted to look at a net payment, you know, you'd have to pay the $3,900. So your net payment would be $40,956. If you actually, your actual revenue plus the net payment, that means you would, you would get essentially close to $106,562. And so if you kind of want to look at that as terms of expected revenue and the revenue with insurance, you basically are getting about 19% less, 19 less than what you expected. So overall, this is probably the fundamental choice and decision you would make when you're running these numbers is, can you take a hit of 19% loss in your revenue in a given year and still go on farming? In fact, that's kind of the beauty of whole farm revenue. It isn't about how individual crops do, but rather how your whole farm revenue did. And in a way, I've always been inspired by this product because it, and it incentivized diversity, which we'll get to a little bit later, but it also, um, in a sense, is 
helping you to continue farming, which I think is probably a more fundamental need of farmers than whether your uh, strawberries did poorly or whatever. Alternatives, if I were to try to ensure these same crops in another way, um, I could only do that for strawberries and, and that would give me a revenue history. And by the way, you can mix and match. You can take a whole farm revenue policy for the whole farm and if you were growing strawberries in Santa Cruz, you could come back and take a separate policy out on your strawberry as well. So you can actually mix and match policies. And some farmers here in Montana do that, I know for sure, with whole farm. So that's another option to think about. Apples uh, is uh, actual production here, history, where they call it APH, which is again only yield. So if you wanted to just destroy apples in Santa Cruz, you would only be able to do it with a yield policy and wine grapes themselves, and all the other crops, well, there would be no available way to ensure. And I would say the diversity, the more crops you grow, the, generally the lower the premium. Um, there's a little bit of a trick here, but if I were to take um, and do the same scenario, but only use three crops, the same values, the same things, we're only talking about three crops, you would note that the premium would raise to 4,619 compared to the 3,000 for the five products. So this diversity, this fact that you are, you go, if you went from a three product farm to a five product farm, you would actually get this discount of 15%. And that's encouraging diversity. This is probably my principal interest in it from a public policy and a long-term view of sustainability because our, this insurance is actually incentivizing diversity and lowering costs because of that, you know, the cost, the public cost and the cost of the farmer because of it. However, it's not like a simple thing to say that if you go from three to five, you automatically get 15% because again, it depends on which, which five and which three crops you're talking about and their location because the risk of growing any specific crop is different in different counties and depending on which combination of crops, the discount can vary quite a bit. And, I, and that's so it's not just a simple, single way to say that. It's unique, again, to every producer. Um, again, again, contact a crop agent for a quote. The quote for your farm may be different from, obviously, from the one in here. Um, what records are needed in purchasing a pilot? Again, the tax forms, uh, showing revenue and expenses, the yield data, you're gonna to have to have yield data, price data, uh, and you generally have to be eligible for federal programs, for instance, US citizenship or residency is, is, is necessary. Um, the yield and price data, of course, if you're growing the same crops, often that's based on your history, we'll talk about a little bit more, but your history and uh, your price data is again on your sales records and or other sources. Of, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, this is what it looks like, and it just looks like a kind of a extensive form, but this is the basic form of setting out your expected revenue in your insurance year, and you do this with your agent, and, and the agents are responsible for filling out the form. You do just bring in the data for helping them fill it out. But as you can see, I mean, this, this farm here just has one, two, three, for five different products. But if you were going up to 10 or 12 or 15, this, this, this um, form would get more and more complicated. You also have a, a revised and the final you see there, you have the intended, the revised. So even along the crop year, as things change, you make revisions and, and that is important you know, in growing because things change. Each commodity, each commodity or each, pro they call them commodities in whole farm. They call everything a commodity, whether it's a, a vegetable or an animal, but it's a commodity or products, I call them. And they have their separate code. And so uh, you have to set out everything by distinct specific commodities. Uh, in Santa Cruz County for whole farm, there are 164 different products listed as you, um, uh, as you use the cost estimator, for instance. So there's a lot of options. And even if a product isn't on that 164 list, you can always um, use something with called an other crop or an other livestock product. 
However, if you do use other laws, so if you're growing something that's very unusual, not one of those 164 products, you know, it will cause your premium to go up because it'll be an unknown, and an unknown causes usually risk to be higher and therefore premiums to be higher. But it, it is possible to have very, very unique and um, different crops, uh, and they can be under. So again, and then always report any changes to the uh, to that report as you go. And again, I was telling you, you've got to revise in the final as you're going along. Determining expected price. In some ways it's not hard if you, for instance, have a contract for uh, uh, for your products. Then it's, that's probably the most easiest way to substantiate the price that you expect in the year of insurance is to have a contract for it. And that works the easiest. You can have your historic records of prices, and it can be an average of your historic records. In a sense, this is somewhat, you have to validate what you, your likely price will be by some source, either historic or contract or third party, um, um, like, a, like a marketing report, an AMS report, an agricultural market service marketing report. Again, um, you have to work that out with the agent yields the same thing again if you have historic yields that's relatively easy to do if you are growing a new crop for the first time that's harder to do but again you have to get supporting information from some other source to justify the price and yield and then ultimately the revenue that each of those products will generate as the basis of your insurance and again see your agent for the details of that oh i think i might have Okay, and then always be prepared to make a claim. And with all insurance, this is true, whether it's crop insurance or car insurance or home insurance. Um, and there's a specific mandate that if you have a, for instance, a uh, something that, a multiple peril that affects your crop, you should report it within 72 hours and you should document everything that in terms of a loss and even take pictures. Um, you know, it, it doesn't hurt um, they will be an adjuster at the end when you're making a claim and you'll have to verify that claim and you'll have to have reported to your insurance agent. Same thing like a car, whenever you're in an accident, the same kinds of things. Um, so uh, one big problem with whole farm, of course, is there's a record keeping there and you have to do it. You do have to do that for individual crops too, but um, it's a little bit more when you're doing the whole farm as a, as a unit. Um, it's time to collect all these forms. You know, is is this, is this an investment? Uh, is, do you see crop insurance as an investment? Do you see it as a cost to your production? Um, how risk averse are you? Uh, how has your history at risk? Maybe you're very diverse already and you feel your diversity is sufficient. This is not a policy for everyone necessarily, but it, it's potential. Uh, again, it really does take time and money to just decide some of these things. There are deadlines for for applying. Probably the most of the sales closing debt, and the deadlines are dependent because people file their taxes in different times, uh, in different ways. They can have what they call early fiscal filers, late fiscal filers. Those dates give you a sense of where that is. And calendar is spelled wrong. I noticed that at the last minute, but um, calendar is kind of the normal we think of as a calendar year. Um, but here's when you you have to apply. So for this coming year, uh, in Santa Cruz County, that's uh, the, that's March 15th. So it is coming up pretty fast. And then you can see the different dates to cancel and other things. It does vary by county, although really it really varies by region. Uh, the biggest change is when you get really far south. The whole cropping seasons are different and the tax filings are slightly different, so they're slightly different times. Uh, I think for most, I noticed that LA County did have some of the earlier dates, but a lot of Central and Northern California seems to have these 315 dates for closing. Um, again, there's practical record keeping considerations. You need sales revenue, production expenses, uh, your tax forms, of course. Um, and it's easier if you have a fewer amount of products. And now we can stop for some questions. Great. Thank you, Jeff, for that overview and kind of run through of different options as well as the whole farm revenue protection program. 
Um, so we did have a couple questions come in. And the first one is, uh, just because you have three commodity crops would not necessarily allow a commodity credit of three crops unless revenue is generated, correct? Yeah, what, what, what the, I think the questioner is getting at is what's called commodity to count. And I tried to explain that. But what it means, it's a little formulaic, but basically if you have, let's say, two crops that represent the majority, let's say 80% of your income, and, and, that, and that even may, may work, maybe the only one's 20%, there's a formula, and each product has to contribute a significant portion uh, to the total whole farm. So in other words, if you have just a little patch of cabbage out there and it doesn't generate much revenue towards the whole farm, but it nonetheless is what you're growing, you can, you can list it out, but what will likely happen is you only get two commodities counting and not three, and, or that last thing, if it's a, if you bundle all the ones that are smallish, that could be a third commodity bundled together. But, but yeah, basically just a lot of little things don't necessarily give you that commodity count. And the only importance of the commodity count is that when you want to go to the higher level of coverage, you have to have three or more. Great, thank you. And then the next question that came in is, if historic yield and price data is necessary for WFRP, how do you apply for WFRP when pursuing a new crop or livestock product for the first time? It's harder. Um, with price, it could be done by having a contract. Let's say you're growing something the first time and you do establish a contract for growing that new crop. Let's just say it's cabbage. I'm gonna grow cabbage for the first time. I've got a cabbage buyer who's going to give me a contract. That will at least give me the price side. Now the yield side is gonna be much more difficult. And certain crops, um, there are histories. Um, some of the major commodity crops you can actually get yield histories in your county, it's called county average yields. Those could be applied if you were growing one of those crops that would be within the crop insurance program. That would be another source. Um, you could have record, you could have, um, you could uh, use some um, third party source uh, expansion having some approximate yield uh, um, that you, for that crop, expectation of that crop. Um, it's harder. You have to find some kind of third party verification that you'll be able to meet that yield requirement. And if you can't, yeah, then it would not be one that you could include in, in your shareability under Whole Farm. Great, thank you. So I think we're going to move on to the next section of the presentation. But if anybody has any more questions that come up, feel free to write them in while we're. Um, continuing the presentation and we'll have another question and answer session at the end. So with that, Jeff, thank you for that overview of WFRP and now Anne, welcome. And we will um, talk a little bit about how organic records and organic certification can kind of help towards crop insurance. Thank you, Megan and Jeff. And as Megan mentioned in the introduction, I look through two lenses. As an inspector, I verify compliance with organic regulations. And as an NCAT ATRA specialist, I try to help farmers manage their businesses more successfully. And I think there are many ways in, the, in which the, the process of organic certification can help with preparing to obtain and benefit from crop insurance. So what information do you have from your organic certification that will help with crop insurance and record keeping? I think these are questions of, of design, how you set up farm management and record keeping systems in a way that helps you plan for and manage and address production on at least three levels. The commodity level, as Jeff mentioned, the whole farm and the environment. And even though we won't enter into a detailed accounting on the environmental level, it is an important part of the overall benefit of organic production. There, are, okay, so there, there are many ways to, to look at the, 
at the what Jeff referred to as commodities. And I think it's useful to just in kind of a big picture sense to express this as either a crop or a livestock project product or an enterprise or cost center or production center. Those are kind of accounting terms mixed in with production terms. And together these up to add up to the whole farm with each commodity bearing an appropriate portion of fixed cost, including land use and capital expenses and office expenses, liability insurance, but also operating costs, and to set up your record keeping system so you can more easily track the flow of money, time, and production by commodity. And designating a, a method, a person, a place, and a time to keep your records will help you create the continuity from a specific action or transaction to a summary that's useful. So here we're looking at the, just the, the overview summary of USDA organic regulations for crop production. You, each requirement represents an opportunity to consider design of your farming system for best production and for profit. Your farm benefit will benefit, your farm business will benefit as you invest in organizing your records to capture the meaningful raw data as close to where it happens as possible. And then thinking about how that information can be summarized and correlated with other relevant information to help you analyze what's heading in the right direction to help you meet your business and natural resource and personal goals, but also to purchase policies and submit claims for insurance benefits. And of course, to inform your future decision making. Now, um, Organic regulations provide, these are some of the foundational strategies for risk management that are embedded in the organic regulations. These are systems thinking and planning, um, use of well-adapted varieties, conservation of soil and natural resources, managing plant nutrients, building soil organic matter, preventative pest management, contamination prevention, and preservation of product identity through an audit trail traceability. Next, similarly with organic regulations for livestock production that require selecting species and breeds that are well adapted to your environment, maintaining living conditions and preventative health care practices for the well-being of animals that reduce stress and prevent injury and illness. And the regulations focus on practices to maintain a healthy resource base and protect from contamination from nutrients and heavy metals and, and soil, water, and air. Now, all of these are, um, are things that will help reduce your risk, manage good operation, but also serve multiple goals of helping you achieve organic certification. So, next. Sometimes I think it's useful to, to think about the whole farm, and we can look at this through a variety of lenses. Um, whether insurance or organic certification or simply business management. Of course, in organic certification, we're looking at specific inputs and making sure that those are allowed. But for insurance and business management, we'll look at the expenses associated with each of those inputs as well. As a whole farm system, of course, being able to pay land rent or property taxes, that's on the, on the, for the whole farm business. Yet each commodity you produce needs to pay a portion of that cost or account for a portion of that. Similarly, if you buy a load of compost or lime or fertilizer that you spread over an entire field, you can set up your record keeping system to attribute a portion of that fertilizer or compost uh, to each commodity. Or if you have a livestock operation, you may get a, a truckload of chicken feed but you'll be able to account for how much of that went to each flock of birds. And then similarly, the management practices, even though you may not have um, money flowing directly, everything you do on a farm involves um, some kind of time and expense accounting. And it's really important to account for that time and try to, to attribute that appropriately to each commodity similarly as the production and sales. 
both for organic and for many other purposes, including insurance, you'll want to track overall production, but also production per land area or per flock so that you have a yield and um, not just a quantity, but also an amount of money produced there. Next. So as I've been preparing for this webinar and visiting farms in recent months, I've asked farmers and thought about different strategies for, for risk management. And I've been hearing that the highly diversified farms, they have so many, um, so many crops that, that they're not inclined to see crop production or whole farm revenue insurance because if one thing doesn't work out, another one will, or they'll replant and try again. But it does seem to be really helpful for farms who have between three and seven crops. And, and that's when the insurance would, would be helpful. And there are several types of insurance, of course. Um, many farmers would say that they, they self-insure. And I think that involves Every kind of record keeping you do can help you to keep good accounts, pricing and, and price appropriately. You need to manage your pricing for profit and also for resilience. I'll comment a little bit more on that on the uh, future slide, but other kinds of insurance are important as well as crop and whole farm revenue insurance. Next. Everything you do is complementary in helping organize and support complementary goals. These are, this is a, a summary of some of the, the various benefits of organizing records by commodity, by year and season, or batch or flock or herd, whatever is appropriate to your farm. Just to help business management, and I've seen farmers recognize patterns that as they keep records that help them solve problems more readily. Of course, you can achieve organic certification, but that feeds into many other benefits such as the capacity to trace products back to the field and forward to the point of sale for food safety and other types of regulations. Evaluating enterprise profitability, we'll look at that a bit more. Qualifying for loans, of course, is, is a complementary benefit that insurance benefits your ability to qualify for loans and vice versa. And of course, every business needs to file the tax returns. And one can organize records based on the categories in Schedule F that may help streamline records. Next. I want to mention um, just a few resources that provide different perspectives. The University of California has a set of, of enterprise budgets or cost studies that are increasingly available for organic crops. This slide shows how the, some of the crops, these are organized by county on the UC Davis website. I think these are can be very helpful just in, in terms of breaking down costs and figuring out what what goes into producing each commodity and making sure that you, you're accounting for all the different elements in, um, involved in, in producing a crop, managing fertility, managing pest, pests and weeds, irrigation, all that sort of thing. If you, next slide. USDA has a few record keeping aids on their website. You can find those on the, the RMA website. This one is a, a pretty basic summary of the kinds of things you'll need to, and of course this complements what Jeff mentioned is the, the, farm, the farm operation report, the intended revised and final. There are a couple different forms there. Next. Of course I work for, National Center for Appropriate Technology, and we have a number of, of tools that are designed to help farmers. This one is a set of templates that's also on the USDA 
National Organic Program website under the Program Handbook. And you can find these on both websites and download them and adapt them as needed. Next, here's one example of um, a template for community-supported agriculture. And this one shows not only the quantity of product produced, but also the revenue. And I also want to mention that, that CCUF has a number of youth useful templates on their website. And I don't have an example right here, but you can find them easily under CCUF if you, you uh, search for CCUF record keeping tools. And there are a number of templates that are in Word, Excel, and also Google Forms. And in that context, I'm going to mention that um, CCUF has presented some previous webinars that review several specific record keeping programs that I think are, are very useful, including digital record keeping. And one of those was given last year by, by my former colleague, Thea Rittenhouse. And you can find that one by searching CCUF organic record keeping seminar, record keeping webinar series growers. I think it's worth mentioning um, that there are a number of different templates that you can find and download and then adapt to your to your needs. Some of them are really designed for specifically for organic and may not include revenue, or they may not be designed specifically by crop or variety. You can adapt these forms. So you can download uh, templates, you can design your own forms, or you can buy software. And I think what I've seen most farmers do is a combination of these. And that webinar I just mentioned provides some suggestions for how to do that and find a way to go from specific transaction or specific activity to a summary that helps you analyze and summarize in a way that's useful for the various um, purposes that you need to fulfill. Next. So, NCAT ATRA is available. This slide shows our, our toll-free number. I've added in the one um, in Spanish in case you know somebody who speaks only Spanish. This is a bilingual English-Spanish line, the 411-3222. And for those who prefer email, of course, there's ask an ag at NCAT. And I think that it's really useful just to to look at at your organ your farm organization through the variety of lenses of of things that you need to fulfill to track production, track yield, and track revenue by commodity, so that it's your record keeping system serves all your needs to improve your production systems, to have good business management, to obtain organic certification to comply with food safety regulations, to apply for loans, to file your taxes, and to obtain insurance policies. And I believe Jeff and I are, would both welcome you to contact us to discuss any of these, or also to share suggestions you may have for specific practices or templates or resources that you think are particularly useful for other farmers as well as as for your own business practices. Thank you. I, I'm glad that we'll have some time for questions and discussion. And Jeff, you can jump in here and describe some of these. Yeah, these, um, if you go to our ATRA website, um, there is now a, a specific uh, sub website, <laughs> which you call link anyway, which uh, when you go to the different topics, there's one called crop insurance. and all of the documents I, I highlighted here are on that. And uh, I've been doing this, like I say, for 14 years. So I've done quite a bit of writing on various alternatives of crop insurance. And I think we're getting a pretty good website for crop insurance for organic and non-organic and just in general for sustainable agriculture. Um, do I have access to, I wanted to go to the next slide. But, oh, there you go. 
I, I do want to take a couple take homes. Whoop, can we go back? Oops, there I am. Um, again, crop insurance also, you know, I just want to point out that obviously taxpayers are paying a considerable amount of the premium cost of crop insurance. These are not, they are private companies, but they basically are essentially servicing the products for the federal programs. So, and, and the agents are there to serve you. Um, I say this particularly because whole farm revenues is relatively new, passed in the 2014 farm bill, been out there for several years now, but it's not necessarily one that all agents will know well. They often will, will be more interested or know single crop policies more than the whole farm. But you can go into anyone and demand a quote on your farm. You provide them the information, their obligation under the law to provide that for you. So, um, and, and met most crop insurance agents are fine and, and do know all of the policies. Um, again, determining this policy and really with all is you, you should be satisfied with what you're getting. You know, particularly this expected revenue for the year in which you're insured upon a lot of upon which you're you're um you're hoping to you know if you have a jaguar and you insure it you want to insure it for the price of the jaguar or at least close to the value of the jaguar if you have a ford you don't need to quite do it as much and it's somewhat the same with whole farm but you want to make sure that you know when your bottom line is done and you have some level of coverage that the value of your insuring is what you and the cost of what it is is clear to you and you know what your expectations are and 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 go forward or not uh, be satisfied don't um, this is, it's not a it's not something that you have to do um and again i really like whole farm because it offers incentives for for diversity it's probably the main reason i got involved with it 14 years ago i do think it's a kind of insurance that incentivizes what i would call a more sustainable diverse agricultural systems of which many organic farmers uh, rep represent in this country. And again, good rec giving is, is a good source for your bottom line. And in some ways, I kind of jokingly say the whole farm is a, is a policy that requires good record keeping. And therefore, it's actually good to take out whole farm in some sense because it requires you to do that good record keeping, which I think is essential as an economist and a person who's tried to farm many times in my life. It, good business records and record keeping in general is the primary key to success. For that, um, some more questions. Oop, wrong way. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Anne and Jeff. We did have um, a question come in, and I also wanted to loop back around to who we have in the audience um, from the beginning of the webinar. And we have both folks from California and Washington online and um, a lot of mixed fruit and veg um, producers. So we had someone write in that um, was wondering a little bit about the beginning farmer requirements. And they ask, beginning farmers only need three years of Schedule F. However, to have a five-year history, will two years of the last year be used? Um, and then they also wrote in and gave some kind of examples for what their um, their revenue was for the past um, three years. If you if that would be helpful to have for the question. Um, beginning farmer is only for this crop insurance policy, whole farm revenue. Is does the USDA and RMA define a beginning farmer? as a farmer who has farmed 10 years or less. Um, it's weird, but for all other crop insurance, the RMA defines a beginning farmer as five years, or I um, mean, um, yeah, uh, 10 years, five years. Anyway, it's different for, um, for, for, for this policy. And so, and that's important because you get a discount. The record keeping is you have to have filed three filed years of, of revenue. So you have to have filed. And that does, there usually is a leap year in there because the year in which you insure, you may not have a completed filed Schedule F. And so it, it does, in a sense, mean really in your fourth year because you have that year that you're still waiting for the taxes to be filed and 
finished while you're getting ready to apply for the for the insurance so you have to have those three years prior so it, it even though it says three in a sense it's really four i guess it partly depends on when you file location in the country all of that but it really essentially just means you have to have three years of schedule f now as to the number that you have for your revenue you might be getting at an issue which is that if you're a beginning farmer maybe particularly maybe for a beginning organic farmer your 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 whole farm revenue in those first three years that you file taxes or those five years that you tax it might be highly variable um or you know kind of maybe moving up in a, in a you know maybe kind of trending up or hopefully but even then it's hard to say because of weather and things that you know the variability of a, of a farm any particular farmer's revenue is completely different between farmers uh, and so it's really hard to say but to the degree that you have high variability of revenue or you just kind of learning curve then your average is going to be lower well what does that mean that means probably in your this sixth year of farming you're getting better and you're being more consistent and perhaps less variable in your income but you're stuck with that historic revenue that is in fact based on a highly variable which is much lower and remember i said the insurance is determined by the lower of those two things so you might not be getting the full value in the year you want to insure the what you expect to to cover now there's some things that we didn't go into in this in this webinar which are explained and is which is brand new for this coming year because of the 24 uh, between the 2018 farm bill i should say there's a way in which there is a compensation to index you can do a number of new decisions you can say i want to drop the lowest the the zero the lowest year that i had in my history and then recalculate the the revenue or you can take um your average and you take 60% of your average and in any low years that are below than 60% of your average you can put the average that 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 60% number in there that again will change your revenue to be higher there's already built into whole farm an indexing which if you're trending upward you're getting closer to the year in which you're doing there's even a final option called an expanding farm and that's only up to a 35% total and that comes when you can when you can you can document that you physically have expanded your acreage or your production amount so there are other alternative decisions which you did not cover here that uh, make it so that your history is closer to your your current year and that's good because that means your deductible in a sense has just lowered and 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 you're getting closer to the value of what you expect to you know to produce insurable I maybe went on too long but <laughs> <laughs> Great, I think thank that's you. what you were getting at <laughs> yeah yeah i think that's good and and they sort of uh wrote in and said for example like if in 2016 you had um 160,000 in revenue in 2017 you had 180,000 in revenue in 2018 you had 20,000 in revenue um your average pretty low, isn't it? Or lower than you would think with those other two, right? So you would average those three, basically. Yeah. You, well, you start. The basis is to average. Now, in that case, for instance, the 20, you could have an option. You can. These are or questions. You could either say, oh, I want to drop that low year and then just take the average of the other two. And that is now doable. That is actually something we worked very hard to reform in the 2018 Farm Bill so that you can drop that low year and that would what would that do that would probably bring your historic revenue very close to the year closer at least to the year that you're insuring now and if you physically expanded your farm as i said that would be another that's always been in the policy it's called an expansion factor and essentially if you document that you just suddenly jumped 100 percent of your acreage of course your revenue is going to be higher than your historic average and therefore Unfortunately, it's still limited, but up to a 35% with expansion, you can increase that, that, that approved revenue. That's the basis of your insurance. So there's mechanisms to take care of some of those historic problems, and they're very new. This is not, uh, 2019 was the first, um, um, actually, no, I'm sorry, this coming year is really the first year these are in place, these options. So it's gotten better. It's, it's the same thing, but better in terms of, giving you a better coverage for your whole farm's revenue, the, the value that you expect to insure. Great, thank you.
And then we have one more question that um, from a farm that grows a wide variety of crops, um, around 20, and is thinking because of the diversity, whole farm might not be the best option, um, and was wondering what other options there might be for a farm like that. Well, to give you the quick answer, there really are none. I mean, there. if you're growing 20 crops, you could pick, and if it's available, and as I demonstrated to you, it's not always available, if you have some crops that are very valuable and there is an alternative insurance policy in your county available, you could insure those individual crops. That's one alternative. And the and the whole farm is the alternative, and it's true. I mean, the reason we were always saying this three to seven um, in part is because just you have to think of it this way. And people, this is a really hard concept. You're insuring your whole farm's revenue, not a specific crop. Well, let's say in that 20 crop farm, 10 of the crops did really, really well, and 10 of the crops did really, really poorly, or maybe they didn't do as poorly as the 10 that did really, really well. Well, likelihood is that your whole farm revenue isn't going to change very much because you don't have all your eggs in one basket. So something goes up and so your whole raw farm revenue doesn't. And so in that case, is, in fact, I would argue probably the more diverse you are, the less variability you have in revenue over time. I can't document that with research, but you know, it makes a logical theory. And if that theory is true, then whole farm may be less and less valuable because really you, your diversity is in your insurance. So we've had many farmers tell us that my diversity is my insurance and it, it, may, it may well be. And again, and if there's no other option, then um, unfortunately we have made in a public policy, we have made an, an argument for a reform to create something, and we haven't figured out how to do this, something like what we would call a catastrophic policy Many of the people that have highly diverse farms, of course, some things go good and some things go bad, but what if everything goes bad? Catastrophe. That's called catastrophic insurance. Um, while it doesn't exist yet for a farm like that, we want to explore and have tried to promote in, in public policy debates about maybe creating something under the whole farm that would provide a kind of catastrophic, should you know, a flood or fire come through and wipe everything out, it would be nice to have for those kinds of farms a kind of catastrophic policy. But as of today, that doesn't exist. But stay tuned. I have a few more years to work, so maybe we can make that happen too. Hey, Jeff, well, I think I'll, I'll jump in a little bit too, just to echo what Jeff said, but also emphasize that when you start record keeping and analyzing the records, and re really using your records to serve you to figure out what how your farm is working well and what which um, products are the most profitable or which cost centers or which enterprises or which commodities, whatever word you want to use. Um, I visited a farm recently that has over 120 varieties of fruits and vegetables and both annual and perennial. Um, but I think they they've done the analysis by crop, even though their their insurance is their diversity. They also recognize that they get about 16% of their income from cilantro. So the farm that has 20 crops, all of those may be in, an important part of your, your cushion, your, your resilience. You may have a few crops that are, are significant contributors to your revenue that you may, able to, may be able to pick out um, a smaller number that actually are are significant to your revenue and therefore worth exploring the the question of insurance under whole farm you know that and that reminded me of another thought um with the, the the higher diverse the really diverse farms is you could consider it's still paperwork and the paperwork may be too much to bear so but if yeah. you took um a 50 percent coverage policy rather than a 85 the premium would be way lower, way lower. I mean, considerably lower, particularly with a 20 crop farm. So whole farm might work then just by, for a catastrophe, but again, then you only have 50% of the whole covered. So, I mean, it's, uh, I guess 50% in a sense is better than nothing, but, um, but that's a significant loss to bear year to year, but that's another angle you could think about. 
And also think about the how your efforts can can serve multiple benefits at the same time. And I think there are many ways in which organic record keeping can serve your business interests as well as insurance. For example, in documenting biodiversity on your farm, you may take a series of photographs uh, throughout the year, and those photographs may also serve you in in documenting your crop in case of a loss and the, the type of production that you're capable of sustaining in, in good times. Great, thank you for those ideas and kind of, again, reiterating how you can use record keeping to meet multiple purposes. So you're sort of covering many bases that in one action. Um, that's great. So I think we're gonna wrap up um, again uh, to the audience, if you have any additional questions, um, both Anne and Jeff are welcome to follow up with you and we will be sending out an email that has a link to the recording and the PDF of the slides and folks contact information as well as some of the resources that people mentioned during the webinar. So keep an eye out for that. It'll come out, it takes us a couple of days to get things up on our website, but we'll send that out once it is. And Anne and Jeff, thank you again for taking the time out of your busy day to give us a nice overview of crop insurance and good tips on record keeping and how to streamline things um, to manage farms well. And thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And just a quick wrap up. We have some upcoming events in January and February. There'll be a webinar on managing soil and irrigation for drought. And then in February, uh, the CCOF annual meeting, the theme this year is Rooting for Organic and it'll be in Sacramento, California. So if you're located in California and wanna come meet us in person, that's a great way to connect with other farmers and organic producers um, and, um, also go talk to representatives um, on Capitol Hill. So thank you for joining us and please fill out your evaluation form. It will pop up in the window once you close out of GoToWebinar. And just a note that uh, the way GoToWebinar does their surveys, they're not anonymous, they are attached to your name, but we really value your feedback. We get really good ideas on new ideas for education programs as well as how to improve what we're doing. So we, we like good as well as constructive criticism. So please send us that our way and have a good afternoon and a good rest of your week. Mm -hmm.